You are listening to a White Phosphorus Pictures podcast. Broadcasting under the night sky from the edge of an undisclosed jungle on the Gulf of Mexico, I'm Christopher Garitano, your voice in the night. For the next hour, allow me to be your guide into the bizarre unknown, the fantastic macabre, and together we'll journey to that borderland between fiction and reality, a place beyond all rational explanation. We are now off to the witch. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Off to the Witch newsletter. For those of you who are just tuning into this podcast for the first time, uh, this isn't one of our regular episodes. Every other week, uh, I have decided to do an Off to the Witch newsletter where I can further discuss what's up ahead, what we previously did, bringing more details into the situation, and it's much more of a free form uh podcast than the usual podcast. So in this case, I get to uh, speak my mind for a little while. It's quite a busy time right now. I have several projects happening at once. And um, one of the things I just released recently is a uh, new web series called Between Fiction and Reality. And um, I have a wealth of archived footage, but I'm also shooting new things for it as well. And um, the first few episodes uh, are me reflecting on a lot of things I've done before, investigations. You know, I've I've personally explored many different types of paranormal phenomena, conspiracies, strange happenings. And so I'm kind of revisiting those places and some of which I've never shown the public. So one of the things I wanted to talk about briefly um, is that I'm starting to upload all of my back catalog of Off to the Witch to my YouTube channel. And that's um, YouTube at Off to the Witch. Uh, There's a variety of things happening there. And, um, you know, I designed this podcast so that the episodes don't expire. Uh, You know, perhaps the newsletters do, but the actual episodes don't. They're stories. And the idea was to have stories that somebody could listen to 30 years from now and still get something out of it. To not feel like it's some news report or we're talking about current events or something that's happening through celebrity gossip or anything that expires. I'm not interested in that, uh, or at least not interested in creating that. So Off to the Witch was designed so you could listen to it in years to come and still enjoy these stories being told by a variety of people uh, with a, a multitude of subjects. And that was the idea always. That's that's applicable to my television shows and um, anything I write about. I, I want it to last. I want it to have legs that go on. I want people to see these things and hear these things for generations to come. So... Um, between fiction and reality, uh, I'll make as many as I'm interested in making. And right now, I'd say I have a solid 10 planned with three on deck right now. And um, so tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about those. One of them, I just premiered. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, you can go to my YouTube channel. Uh, It's YouTube at Off to the Witch. And... um, Look for Between Fiction and Reality, Episode 1. And uh, it is about the God Helmet. Now, the God Helmet is a device that I explored briefly in the very first episode of my television show, Strange World, that premiered in 2019 and premiered throughout 2020 and around the world in different networks. And so um, it was designed by two scientists Uh, Michael Persinger primarily, and Stanley Curran. And uh, the the helmet itself affects the temporal lobe. And I go through that in the very first episode. You'll see scenes from Strange World, if you've not seen those scenes before, some archived footage of Michael Persinger and my perspective on the helmet that I really didn't get to establish in any of my television shows because there's only so much time you can tell that story in that format. You know, with Between Fiction and Reality... 
Every episode is going to regard some experience I've personally had or some kind of legend or, or mystery or conspiratorial idea that I personally explored and investigated. But I do, you know, but there is a variety, uh, much like the Off to the Witch podcast, that it would shift gears, that it doesn't always have to be uh, a mystery or a conspiratorial idea. However, there's one episode that I'm merging. Uh, a, a fantastic experience I had, and I've mentioned this briefly before, is that after I made my very first documentary, Horror Business, um, and that was in the early 2000s, I ended up actually getting distribution for it from Image Entertainment. Uh, they put it out on DVD, and it was in all stores. It was distributed in uh, Best Buy and Tower Records and all over the video stores at the time. And uh, it was an exciting thing, but the great filmmaker who was my hero as a kid George Romero had an opportunity to see it and this was a scrappy little you know documentary shot on tape I had no money I had no crew I didn't even really know what I was doing you know film school sets a foundation that later you refer to and you realize how much you truly learned if you paid attention but the true uh, film education begins after film school and that's up to you how far you want to take it you know if you want to be part of the of the greater good, so to speak, a crew member, career crew member, which we need, um, then, you know, that's your choice. But if you decide to be a movie maker, then you must learn, in my opinion, a great movie maker understands every job on the set. And at some point, one way or another has done every job and understands it. And um, that's how you become a true movie maker. You have to, you have to get in the dirt. You have to learn how to do it. And George Romero was the epitome of that. You know, Night of the Living Dead, he was the cinematographer. He was the co-writer. He was the producer. He was the director. He was the editor. You know, he learned all these things before he collaborated with more people on that movie that is immortal. Like I was telling you before, it's that same uh, dynamic. A great motion picture doesn't have to have a ton of money behind it. It doesn't have to have celebrities in it. It doesn't have to have um, the greatest special effects. Movies like Night of the Living Dead had none of the above, okay? And it will stand the test of time forever. Someone's going to be watching that movie as long as humans have eyes and they have an interest in cinema. Night of the Living Dead will be viewed. Night of the Living Dead will be experienced and celebrated. And that is what a bunch of somewhat inexperienced movie makers created. And so George saw my documentary, my scrappy little documentary horror business, and um, found an interest in it, as, as did a few other people. It was, it was an interesting time. You know, I had uh, mutual friends here and there that passed my movie on to some some fantastic people that I loved watching their movies growing up. But in the case of George Romero, it was very much by fate. I was at a screening of his movie, The Crazies, and um, you know he had made the movie in the early 70s and uh, was, was having a kind of a revival showing of it and uh, at a cinema arts center in New York. And uh, I handed him my screener just like probably a hundred filmmakers did that day. And I never expected to hear from him. I mean, he's a super nice guy, but you know, you can't expect these movie makers to respond to every single person. And perhaps he did, I don't know. But all I know is he responded to me. And he loved horror business. He really did. And he wanted to be, he wanted to know if I was doing a follow-up or what I was doing next. And at that time I was shooting a few different documentaries and uh, I said, yeah, I'm shooting a second volume to horror business. And I was calling it at that time, son of horror business. I shot a bunch of footage for it too. So anyhow, George Romero loved that documentary and invited me to the set at the time of his new Living Dead film, Diary of the Dead. And so I accepted his invitation and I went to Canada, to Toronto. And um, I, by his request, met with him. His producer, Peter Grunwald, invited me into George's trailer, introduced us, and I sat down and talked with him. And then I kind of broke out my camera and uh, interviewed him and continued to shoot footage of things that I had only dreamt of being a part of, like sitting with George and John Harrison and Greg Nicotero and all these people that were on set 
in a kind of a huddle while he was planning a scene. I, you know, I'd seen bits of that in documentaries before, but I was sitting there, you know, with my childhood hero while he's directing a Living Dead movie. It was certainly a dream come true. I met some great people on the set and the cast and crew, and uh, it what an experience. So when we went into lockdown during the pandemic, I started to shoot something called Of the Dead, uh, remembering Romero in isolation. And so as projects evolve, and as I'm a creative person, and I keep those creative doors open all the time for that evolution of a project, that I feel it would be fitting for everything I shot for Of the Dead to become an episode of Between Fiction and Reality. Now, this format that I've created, uh, this web series, allows my commentary, because you'll see me speaking about how I felt directly. And everything that I shot during lockdown which was quite an emotional time. And I'll explain why in the actual episode, uh, what was going on in my life at the time. It was, it was crazy just for everybody else too. I'm sure everybody has their own unique experience. This was mine. And I was truly thinking about George at that time. You know, he had passed away so previously to that time. And, um, you know, I started to think about the basics of his storylines in regard to his living dead pictures and in regard to the crazies. You know, this, um, this super flu, this, uh, this tricksy virus that's affecting everybody. Well, we, we kind of lived through that. The way people were acting. I mean, if George was alive during 2020, what a commentary he would have made following. I know he would have been inspired. And in a way, he was still there. Because during lockdown, I had received a pre-order of a book called The Living Dead, which was finished by Daniel Krauss, but was written by George Romero. And, um, you know, it, it was a wonderful feeling to have to receive that during the time I was shooting this of the dead. So the third episode of Between Fiction and Reality will be called of the dead and will be my perspective of not only Meeting George, you're going to get to see all this footage too because I carried a camera with me everywhere I went. So I, I captured these things and this is the first time I've really shown anybody. I've only shown a few close friends this footage from the set of Diary of the Dead, my time with George, and um, even the footage for Of the Dead. So I'm merging these things together and I think they would make the perfect episode of this new web series along with this new interview with myself. Well, one thing I truly wanted to discuss, at least in, in my confessional type portions of this episode, is that I will talk about the possibilities of a George Romero film come to life. Now, I, I believe we've lived quite a bit of it. Believe it or not, you know, this isn't just social subtext, you know, and cinematic subtext. Um, this is reality. We're living in this reality. I think People desperately want to escape sometimes how bad things can get for us. And they're pretty tough right now, believe it or not. You know, um, some people are oblivious and they don't realize what's truly happening. But a good deal of us do and realize we're in deep trouble if things don't change. And we very well could end up like any of George Romero's Living Dead pictures or uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road or, or something like that. There are a variety of things that could happen. I'd like to discuss these elements the best I can in this episode. And so Of the Dead will be episode number three. Uh, but the second episode, the one that's coming first, is going to be about the North American Sasquatch stories. I started shooting a Bigfoot documentary. I've discussed this in a previous newsletter. I have so much footage of this Bigfoot documentary that I was shooting that I think to finally complete it, you know, I've, I've not released any of it. I shot a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And so this is a journey into the unknown while I was shooting that documentary. One of the places I went to was Estes Park, uh, Colorado. And while I was out there to shoot footage for this Bigfoot documentary, I stopped at the Stanley Hotel. And I wanted to go there, so it was planned as part of this trip. The Stanley Hotel is what inspired Stephen King to write The Shining. And so I needed to go there. And it has its own ghost stories, like many old hotels do. You know, frankly, one of my favorite Stephen King stories is 1408. Great movie, too. Um, and that is also about a haunted 
hotel, but a haunted hotel room in New York City. And when I first heard the premise, I had not read the short story at that time, and I later did, and I enjoyed it. But um, when I first heard the premise for the film, I thought it was a little hokey, and I was like, ah, I don't know how I'm going to wrap my head around this. It might not be that great. It was fantastic, because it's all in the, the, the dimensional philosophy and the execution of it. And after I've had my own experiences, wow, I mean, in its own right, 1408, the motion picture, is, is many, in many ways, it's just as powerful as The Shining. And if you haven't seen it and you love a good ghost story, you should check it out. It truly is a unique film and it's very underrated. Uh, 1408 stars John Cusack, Samuel L. Jackson, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic Stephen King adaptation. It's one of the best ones. And um, I think it was overlooked. You know, sometimes the advertising isn't great. Expectations aren't high, so people don't see things. But I think over the over time, 1408 has grown a following. When I talk about it to people who haven't seen it, I try to explain to them, well, you know, Robert Wise's The Haunting, Robert Wise's adaptation of Shirley Jackson's book, The Haunting of Hill House, was one of the greatest cinematic ghost stories ever, you know, ever put on, on film. And um, a lot of that was in the technique and the execution of the haunting itself. Cinema, you know, um, the banging of the walls, the voices in, in, on the doorknob and all of the different perspectives that are skewed and mesmerized and um, atmosphere and editing technique and understanding on how all of that together, that sound design, that camera work, perspective, composition, all affects the audience. There is a language to cinema. And when you understand that language, coupled with a fantastic imagination and a great story, you really have something. You don't have to write down information verbatim because that same information can be communicated through images and sound. And that is the world I uh, come from. That is, I'm a filmmaker. So when I approach the podcast or when I approach a documentary, of course, because documentary movie making has always been um, my favorite. And so I tend to want to give you as much information as possible. However, a lot of that info I'm going to give you through picture and sound. And it's all there. It's just as well researched as anything I'm giving you in an interview that I choose, right, to, to show you at the in the finality or that I'm giving you through narration. And so visuals speak a thousand words. Visuals speak a multitude of things. And um, I love the visual art and the communication of that, you know, coupled with some incredible sound design and music. There's so much you can, there's so much you can communicate to an audience with that. There are those who say that this quiet town holds many secrets. Legend has it that beneath this very tower, a dark force had its eyes set on the children. We were told that what was going on there was for the benefit of humanity. What would you say to the people who say, well, all these children were kidnapped and murdered and you were a part of it. What would you tell them? You I tell did them? approve of it, but there was nothing I could do about it. They wanted a large number of programmed boys to be used for mind control operations. And there are others who say it's still happening to this day. I don't know, I for myself find it a little suspicious that all the evidence has been conveniently destroyed. Let's put it this way. If you're sitting there with 20 guns pointed at you, what are you going to do? Whatever the hell they want! Watch Montauk Chronicles now for free on Tubi, Plex, Roku, 
and available for download on Amazon and Apple TV. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Over the years, I have experienced so many different things firsthand that I, I realized that I could really deliver with this series. So um, the fourth episode, okay, so we'll go, you know, I'll, I'll explain another one. The fourth episode is reviewing the idea that I did explore in one of the episodes of Strange World because I was truly interested in the idea that the government's at least the U.S. government, was meddling with video games, arcade games in the 80s, to affect the player and perhaps even program the mind of the player. And so there was one video game in particular that became a legend that originated in Portland, and it became a legend. It was called Polybius. And um, so I was on the lookout you know, first, I just want to preface this by saying that all of the adventures in Strange World were something that I was truly interested in investigating. And so, yes, it's a it's a show, but it was also very much an investigation. Everything I did was, you know, Montauk Chronicles was very much a character study. I think to call it a true investigation, you need to bring more of a, a state of analysis to the table. But once I started doing network television, and I and I was the creator and executive producer of those shows, so I had now had resources for my investigation, for my documentaries, right? And in the episode, I spoke to everybody from a famous skeptic to the co-creator of Atari, uh, Nolan Bushnell. And, you know, he opened my eyes 100% to the confirmation that this was not simply a legend. Yes, there are embellishments. Yes, there are people who want to uh, perpetuate these urban legends because they're fun, because they love telling stories. People love telling stories. I love telling stories. But I found this middle ground where we don't need to lie about things. There are so many bizarre things that have happened throughout history. Oceans of stories that can be told that um, you know, with a little effort, you can find people who have experienced these things themselves. And so this is partially my philosophy is that I would much rather go and visit these things myself than speak about them secondhand. And so I do. And so this was one of them. And I traveled to the source, to Portland. I traveled all over the US actually for um, all the episodes of, uh, of Strange World and outside of the country. So. Ultimately, especially after speaking to uh, Mr. Atari himself, Nolan Bushnell, and uh, I realized that Polybius was almost stage one. You know, there certainly was some influence in arcade games, 100% been confirmed. But the idea now is what has been the influence, let's say, since the late 80s, throughout the 90s, throughout the 2000s? Uh, and is there a nefarious trigger inside games? Is it intentional? These are great questions that I will bring up, and I'm going to um, I'm going to answer them with some things that I found, and others I um, just going to hypothetically discuss certain situations that I haven't been able to confirm, and I'll never assert that I know the answers. It's one thing that frustrates me about a lot of people who claim they're truly investigating these things is that they assert that they know the truth 100% of some things that are quite fantastic and that we have no evidence of whatsoever. Nobody does. And so the idea is the presentation should be, well, I highly suspect because, and fill in the blank, 
It should never be unless you have proof, honestly, because what it does is it damages the credibility of the people who have experienced but can't produce proof. So there's one way of explaining something is that I, no matter what, even though I don't have any physical proof, I have experienced this. I know I experienced it. And you, and you stand your ground for that. I, I've seen people that claim they know the secrets of the universe and they have nothing to produce or show for it. And um, that just takes the credibility away from, from the supernatural, from things that a lot of us, you know, my listeners right now and, and myself know that it, there's something else to this world. And science itself has has uh, certainly proven it in several ways already, and is coming close to proving it in more ways as we go forward. I'm sure of it. I'm going to talk about these things in further detail, and I'm going to review some places first that I've already looked at, and a lot of footage that you haven't seen. And from there, what I'd like to do is to continue to make these, and I and I really do have a full plate, and I have these feature-length documentaries coming out that I have to finish and shoot more of, and um, but I really do enjoy making between fiction and reality, and I'll keep making it uh, the best I can. If uh, you're a listener of Off to the Witch, a steady listener or a new listener, go over to the YouTube channel subscribe hit the notification bell and have a look at the very first episode if you like it put a like on it if you enjoyed it and want to say something to me put a comment on it um, that's what's going to keep this thing alive because right now i'm making this gratis for everybody to view for free on the channel and um it you know the idea is to help that channel grow and i'll be able to put more things on there for you uh, i will start a patreon eventually down the road and um i'm just like I'd said many times before, I really want it to be worth your while, and I want to put as much as I can in there. Well, there's a lot coming, a lot of behind the scenes of everything from Haunting We Will Go to Monsters Among Us to The Phantom Killer. Those are the three feature-length documentaries in the new um, TV streaming series. But for the YouTube series, too, um, there's so much we can do. And another thing is um, I decided that uh, I'm putting the back catalog of Off to the Witch on youtube as well um, as i mentioned earlier you know these episodes don't expire and one thing i'm doing i th i'm uploading them on um, friday nights sunday nights and maybe one other night there's a lot of them you know we're getting close to 100 episodes so um little by little i'll put them on and they'll have premieres so there'll be a live chat if you want to come in and talk to me i'll always peek in and see what's going on and I've done a few so far, but I haven't really set a schedule, so I'll put out a, a little news post about that. And so I encourage you to go and follow me on social media. You know, um, you can go to my link tree at Garitano7, G-A-R-E-T-A-N-O number seven, and um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I am also planning on a couple of live streams. What I figured I'd do is follow up every episode of Between Fiction and Reality with a live stream. And maybe a few here and there uh, just to discuss a certain topic that I'm interested in. So as these live streams go, I'll probably build up to it. I'll announce it maybe a week or two weeks before I actually do it, just so it kind of builds up to the first live stream. And let's see how many people we can get in there. And uh, if my rants and raves are interesting enough for you. Um, but I'll come in with something interesting for you. And uh Maybe bring some items with me to show you and um, try to do something different with a live stream. We'll have a good time. You know, I'll have some great stories to tell. And I'll, I, I, you know, I'm also, I want to hear your stories. So I hope a lot of you uh, come with some tales you want to tell me. Uh, and we can discuss your experiences as well. I mean, I have plenty of formats where I'm offering my own, so I'd love to hear yours. And I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for me to even hear some fresh voices and perhaps uh, you'll be a guest on Off to the Witch. So, or even a future documentary. So, I think I've covered quite a bit here and I am so excited for um, all of the above. You know, the new docuseries, off to the Witch Presents, which includes uh, A Haunting We Will Go, Monsters Among Us, The Phantom Killer, and I have others planned, but I'm not going to talk about them right now. It is coming out so beautifully. 
And obviously, it's a different format than uh, between fiction and reality, but I'm excited about all of these. This is all that I've dreamt of creating for my entire life. You know, I was a kid when I wanted to do these things, a child, you know, we're going, going back to the 80s. And so, you know, now it's finally here. And uh, what a wonderful time we live in where you don't have to get permission like I have had in the past. I've, you know, and I still, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I have this opportunity to go into a boardroom and pitch and convince somebody to invest quite a bit of money into a, a network show. However, it's also a glorious time for creators that want to have and should have the final say in their work. It's um, the ball is in your court, but that's a good thing if you know how to play. And uh, so I, um, I'm excited for the time we live in. It is, it is the age of self-publishing. And so that doesn't mean, you know, just because it's easy to hit the button, it doesn't mean to lack in quality in your presentation. So I would say you have this glorious opportunity to make something that's going to stand the test of time and think before you put something out in the world, because this, that is you. That represents who you are. And so if you're going to create, if you're going to speak, just spend a little time planning it. You have this glorious opportunity to show the world, hey, the age of self-publishing is viable. And, and the world is showing that because I love the fact that the audience, and I'm one of them too, doesn't care where the stuff comes from anymore just as long as it's something they want and something they enjoy and something they love. And so I say, give all the gatekeepers hell. And on that note, I'm going to get back to practicing what I preach and I'm going to get back to work and I wish you all well. And I hope to see you in these live streams that I'm about to do. And I hope you come to the YouTube channel and subscribe and check out everything that I'm putting up there. And if you're a steady listener of Off to the Witch or a new listener and you haven't heard the back catalog, these episodes are stories that will stand the test of time. And if you haven't heard an episode, it's not old. It's brand new for you because the whole idea was that this was going to be listened to for years to come every episode. Uh, maybe not the newsletters. But the actual episodes of Off to the Witch, go back and check them out and enjoy them and enjoy the stories if you haven't heard them. And um, and now I'm simulcasting on my YouTube channel. So every Wednesday night, you're also going to, it'll premiere on YouTube as well if you prefer YouTube to the regular podcast formats uh, or platforms. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to hear my rant tonight. I will return next week with a brand new regular episode of Off to the Witch, and I will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>